Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. I want to start by saying a massive thank you to all of the patrons of the Tough Girl Podcast, without whose support this podcast would not be coming out every single week. If you want to learn more about becoming a patron, then please do go check out my website, toughgirlchallenges.com, and you too could be supporting the podcast from $2 to $5 to $10 to $20 a month. It all does make a massive difference. The podcast has been growing at a phenomenal rate. We are now listened to in something like 167 countries around the world. And I just wanted to take this short opportunity just to tell you all a little bit more about me in case you are new to the podcast and you're wondering, who is who is this person hosting the Tough Girl podcast? Um, and why did I start the Tough Girl podcast? So very briefly, I used to work in the city of London for eight years before I quit my job in March 2013. Since then, I went on to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. I headed over to South America to go backpacking over there. I cycled Death Road. I climbed the live volcano, the volcano Vilakari, and went on other adventures such as visiting Easter Island, um, one of the most remotest islands in the world. It was while I was over in South America that I really got the chance to think about what I wanted to do with my life and how I wanted to spend my time. And Tough Girl Challenges was born as a result of that. I wanted to motivate and inspire other women and other girls to go after their own personal dreams. Initially, I started with a blog, the Tough Girl blog, but to be honest, no one really read it, but I'd obviously go and check it out now. And that evolved into a podcast after I started giving motivational talks in local schools because I was getting so disheartened by the responses I was getting from young girls about what they wanted to be when they when they wanted to grow up with many of the answers being they wanted to be a wag which is in the UK is the wife or the girlfriend or wife and girlfriend of a footballer so their sole goal in life was to be pretty and to marry a rich man and this was just so disheartening to me and I thought why are our young girls growing up like this, why are there not enough role models? And I went home and I was looking through all the papers, just you know, not really paying attention. And it suddenly struck me, there's never any women's sports mentioned. There's no, you don't get to see female explorers on the TV. You don't get to hear about the amazing female ultra runners who are out there. You just don't get to hear about women who are doing these amazing challenges around the world. And I could have just sat back and complained and said, look, it's not fair. Why is this happening? Why don't women get sponsorship? Why don't women get support? Instead, I decided to do something about it. So I started the Tough Girl podcast with the aim of increasing the amount of female role models in the media. And we've now got over a 100 odd episodes out there. It's free content. There are stories from runners, from open water swimmers to triathletes to adventurers to expedition leaders to travelers um, you name it we've probably interviewed somebody who's got a story to share and what I love about the podcasting world and being able to share these stories is when women share they really get into the emotions they're not afraid of talking about their fears their failures what they learn from the experience and by being able to share in that way other women out there can learn from it and use that to help them with their own areas of growth and development so without further ado we are on to our next or this episode of the tough girl podcast enjoy and thank you again for listening i really appreciate all of your support Today, we're going to be speaking to the amazing Margaret Schlockler. <laughs> I can't even say your name. Say your name for me again. Uh, Margaret Schlockter. Margaret, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am from the U.S., as you can probably tell uh, by my accent. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Tell our listeners, if they haven't heard of you, a little bit more about you. Well, sure. Yeah, I am into... I'll, I'll have been to a variety of things, but most people know me through obstacle course racing. Uh, I started in 2010. In 2012, I <clears throat> excuse me, actually became the first female professional in the sport with paid sponsorships from you know a nutrition company that paid my bills and whatnot. And now, though, I most people know me as I'm editor in chief of 
mudrunguide.com, which is the largest website in the world um, regarding obstacle racing. And then I also started my own site back in 2011, a long time ago, called Dirt in Your Skirt, and um, just recently put made it into a podcast in the last couple months. And it's an awesome podcast as well. You've got some great guests on there. Uh, yes, I had a great <laughs> guest named Sarah Williams on not too long ago. So um, if no. you want to hear more about Sarah that you probably haven't heard her talk about, maybe haven't heard her talk about before, go check that out. Check <laughs> no, <that>. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Definitely go check it out. I was going to say, um, it's a, so let's go back to your childhood growing up. What Tell us a little bit about your family life. You've got your brothers and sisters. Were you sporty? Were you outdoors? Did you grow up in a city in the countryside? Sure. So I grew up in upstate New York, which is not New York City at all. I grew up in a town called uh, Saratoga Springs, New York, which is at the foothills or it's kind of at the foot of the Adirondack Mountains, which are these huge old mountains on the east coast of the United States. And we used to go up there every weekend. So I would say outdoors are just part of me. My mom and dad actually met working for the 1980 Olympics in Lake Placid in the U.S. So I think sports are in my blood. <laughs> but uh, but my actually my first word was deer, as in the animal, and my second word was tree. So yeah, the outdoors have always been part of my life. I've got two younger sisters and a younger stepbrother and a younger stepsister as well. And um, we all grew up, we're vastly different people today, but we all grew up doing different sports. We all did gymnastics at one point. I was horrible at ballet. Uh, but skiing is really, I started um, alpine skiing when I was two. Um, my mom and dad actually, uh, I joke around, pushed me down a hill in the in the nicest way possible, I think you'd say push. But when I could walk, they they got me those little plastic skis that you just sort of strap onto your like winter boots, and and I was going down a, little hills from there. And then skiing kind of became my whole life. I went to a high school that was a private boarding school for uh, alpine ski racers, snowboard competitors, uh, Nordic ski racers. So my high school was very different than. The norm, you know, we I pretty much my whole life revolved around one sport. Um, I was a terrible soccer player, but I did play soccer a little bit and was a lacrosse player in the spring. But otherwise, we did everything to train for alpine skiing. So that was my um, that's what I did. And then I went off to college and was a division three athlete in both skiing and lacrosse. So that's kind of a really condensed version of <laughs> my childhood. Your school sounds amazing. It's like a boarding school on the slopes. It just must have been so much fun. It's like, yeah, we're going out alpine skiing. We're going out snowboarding. What was it like? I mean, had you did you know you wanted to follow your skiing passion from a young age? Yeah, so I, I'm really lucky I'm, and I'm super fortunate. Um, I come from a family that most of our, our, my siblings and whatnot went, we all kind of went to boarding schools and my parents were nice enough to let us all pick what we wanted to do. And I just wanted to ski. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to ski race and I was ski racing already at that time. So my parents said, okay, well you can go do that, but you have to go to a school where you actually get an education so You can't just ski. So I ended up at Stratton Mountain School, which they felt like had the best academics. They had a good college placement and all that sort of all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I mean, my day during the off season, my day was we'd get up around 630 and we would go for a light jog and do some core exercises with our coach for about a half hour, 40 minutes. And then we'd go to breakfast and then I had a pretty typical day of school, I feel like. We went to school from about 8.30 to 2.30 in the afternoon or so. Uh, the only difference is, and then after that, <clears throat> around 3 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we would do some other sort of, uh, we called it dry land training, which actually a lot of it today, if it, it looked similar to almost like a CrossFit workout, but just a lot longer or an endurance workout. We did a lot of plyometrics, weightlifting, um, some running. Then we played other sports in the off season to sort of uh, supplement what we we're doing. So it wasn't just like in the gym every day, monotonous, but then yeah, there in the winter, school got a little bit different. We'd get up and sort of just 
warm up a little bit in the morning and then have breakfast and go out on the slope and go train for our sport um, all morning long, come back in just before lunch, have lunch and then go to school until about five o'clock in the afternoon. And then so we had about five hours of school just straight. We just kind of cut the fat out of uh, of academia and just did our core subjects in the winter and then uh, did a short workout after that and then dinner and dinner, study hall, free time, bed. So it's really like a, a, like living like a professional athlete almost, but you're 13, 14 years old. God, gotcha. it's taking me back to when I did uh, when I did my ski season over in Verbier, and like obviously, I mean, I had like the chalet hosting duties and stuff. But that lifestyle must have just been amazing. You know, waking up, spending time on the slopes, in the mountains, in the fresh air, and just getting to do what you loved, and then you know, cramming in school, doing your routine, doing all your sports. Was it much of a transition when you left the school environment to go to a college environment? Yes and no. Because I ended up going to, I guess you guys would say university. So when I did my next studies and I went to a, a pretty unique college that was a, just a business school. So everybody in the school got the same degree. Um, we just picked our concentrations within the degree, but everybody came out of the school with a degree in business management. So a lot of my day was regimented that way. Uh, because we all kind of were taking the same for the first two years, everyone takes primarily the same, the same class load, um, and course load. And then your last two years, you start taking what you want to and your particular, what, what interests you the most. So, and then I also played two sports. So I would get to school and I would have about just a few weeks and then it would be the preseason, for lacrosse because I was a lacrosse goalie and then we would go into the pre and it's a really short they call it fall ball where you just can practice for a few weeks together and then I would go into my preseason for ski ski racing and then do that until the springtime we would go through our competition season and then I would take a week off but my lacrosse team had already started practicing for the spring and then I'd pretty much do lacrosse until I finished that year out. So a lot of it was really similar. I really like, I liked having that sort of a bit of regimented, um, time. I, I had a lot of free time, but I had a lot more structured than I think a lot of, a lot of students that are just go off to like university and they, they don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> so when did you graduate from college? So I graduated from college in 2005. Um, I finished my undergraduate degree and then I just finished my master's. I took a very long winding route, um, started that in 2009, taking courses part time and then just finished that last spring. What, so, what, what was your master's in? Uh, education leadership. So prior to all the obstacle racing world, I was head of admissions and college placement for a private boarding school similar to the one that I went to in Vermont. And so I was working towards um, getting a degree in that. Although now I write full time. So it's a little bit funny. I have these degrees that don't 100% match up with what I do today. But I think everything sort of feeds into itself. Like, if learning how to think critically works for anything, really. Absolutely. I suppose I'm just really trying to understand the journey of how you got to the obstacle racing from, you know, from the alpine skiing, obviously being incredibly sporty at college and doing the lacrosse for division three and, and continue with your skiing. Yeah. How did you come across like obstacle racing? I'm trying to remember when obstacle course racing sort of really hit mainstream. Yeah. So you guys have had if, since the eighties uh, with tough guy and Billy, Mr. Mouse, he's been kind of the, the, you know, he's kind of the the grandfather, I guess you would say, of the entire industry. But it wasn't really in the, it didn't really hit in the U.S. until 2009, 2010, more 2010. But I happened to, so I was working at one of the schools, like I told you, I was head of admissions, college placement, all that sort of stuff. I was also coaching alpine skiing too. And, but I wasn't really working out myself. I mean, I, 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 I was in okay shape, but I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was fit at all. I was, I 
was your typical 20 something that enjoyed probably a few too many pints and uh, not the greatest, you know, not the healthiest diet in the world. And I just, I saw this thing on, on Facebook actually called Spartan race in the winter, 2009, 2010, and they hadn't had one of these races yet, but they, they advertised it and it wasn't very far from where I lived. So I said, okay, well that looks like fun. I hate running. Absolutely hate running, but they're going to have these obstacle things in between them. So I'm like, well, that, that's going to break up the running. And I've heard this story over and over and over again from so many people that they've said the same thing. Well, I hate running, but these obstacles make it so it's okay. And the funny part about it is you still have to run the distance, whatever it is. But but that's a whole other story. So, yeah, so I found it and I said, oh, OK, I'll just sign up for it on a whim. Did it. And I crossed the finish line. That was the very first Spartan race I ever had. I crossed the finish line. I was like, this is totally different and totally fun. And I want to do more. And I got home and I just started Googling everything I could find. I didn't even know what to call it. Now we know it's called obstacle racing, obstacle course racing. At the time, though, nobody really had a name for it. So I'm like, adventure races? I'm like, no, that's not right. Mud runs? Okay, well, kind of obstacle runs like there wasn't an, anything really so i just found everything i could find that seemed remotely close to it or fun and signed up for as many as i could in 2010 and just just did it as a weekend warrior i you know i had my job full time and i was like oh well this gives me something to do and it gave me a reason to go go get out and go for hikes more again and start to focus on my own fitness. And from there, it's, it's snowballed really quickly. <laughs> Randomly, do you know when you were talking about Mr. Mouse and Billy and um, it's actually held in Wolverhampton and it's called um, uh, Tough, well, the ultimate tough guy or the original tough guy. I did that race back in 2010, I think it was. I did the, the half marathon and it was one of the, it was in the middle of January. I always remember the date. It was January 31st. And I remember afterwards, I looked like I'd been in a car crash. And the amount of bruises on my <laughs> arms and my legs, it, it just completely wiped me. But it's, um, try, could you try and almost go back to that first Spartan race, the, the very, very first one? I mean, how many people were there? What was the atmosphere like? Was everyone like, I don't really know what this is about? Was everyone a bit like, this is a bit weird? Or yeah, what was it like? Yeah, so it was, first off, there were, I believe, less than 500 people there. It was held at the Catamount Center, it's called. It's this kind of wildernessy land area that people can go do some outdoor things in more like hike and mountain bike type thing. But I don't remember there being it, it being, there was no elevation to it. It's base. It was pretty flat, but they had, um, the obstacles were so tiny compared to what, what I mean, what it is now, it was this crazy little homespun event that, I always call it like the freaks and geeks kind of all showed up together. Nobody knew what it was. There was no like, oh, this is what it is. This is what's going on. I just remember wearing, I had these um, like rock climbing cotton capri, like yoga type pants on that weren't the most form fitting thing you've ever worn and had on like a cotton t-shirt. And I always joke around with this too. I actually wrote I've written a couple articles about this, about not wearing cotton in the in the sport, but I had on cotton underwear too. And um, if anybody has ever been out caught out in a rainstorm and cotton everything, you know it's not necessarily what you want to be running around in. And we had to jump in water and swim across a little pond. So just hanging wet cotton clothes are not a good idea for the sport. And I also had shoes that were Gore-Tex. Uh, I remember they're Solomon trail running shoes and they were Gore-Tex, which is when I also learned that Gore-Tex, although a great um, material to keep water out when you're just going for like a trail run or whatnot, it also, when you go for a swim with your shoes on, uh, it doesn't let any of the water go out of the shoe. So the shoe ends up weighing about 10 times more than it did when you started after you've um, gone 
for a swim with Gore-Tex on. So yeah, so it was like I made every mistake that I would that I, you could possibly make going to one of these events because n- had no idea what I was in for. Um, like the I remember the barbed wire little crawling section they had was about the length of my couch. <laughs> it was so short. I mean, it probably was about ten. It was less than ten feet long. And now today they they'll, they'll be like, I don't know sometimes it'll be up to almost a quarter of a mile or so or um so it's just or for like 400 meters long so it, it was just everything was little they the spartan race series is known now for their spear throw back then the first race the spear throw was they painted a circle uh with a hula hoop in the grass and you had to hit it into the circle now they're these big hay bales um up and whatnot and uh and i guess the other biggest difference is it was 20 push-ups now spartan race has become synonymous with burpees but back then it was just push-ups so it was this very much like homegrown homespun there's a video on youtube that my friends actually made and it looks almost like a hippie festival um going on on the the side and some of the b-roll footage they got because there's like these girls showed up with like hula hoops and were like hula hooping and somebody had like a bongo drum. They had a local band playing. They had a blacksmith demonstration. They had a one of those guys that lays on a bed of nails. So they had all these weird things there that made almost no sense. But I don't know, it all seemed to flow together into this kind of crazy alternative activity. <laughs> And you started documenting it as well, didn't you? Through you start well, you started up your blog, Dirt in Your Skirt. How did that all come about? Sure. Yeah. So 2011, um, actually in 2010, I was at a, a Spartan Race series, and this Tough Mudder plane uh, banner flew over the site that says like, "You think this is tough? Try a Tough Mudder." Which the two companies in the early days had this crazy rivalry where they kept trying to outdo each other at every step of the way. So something kind of sparked me when I saw that and I said, oh, hmm, well, that's a 10 to 12 mile race. I've never run anything longer than like a 5K at this point. And probably in my life, I one time in high school, we had to run this like 10 mile stretch that was like awful. (laughs) <laughs> otherwise like when I played lacrosse I was a goalie for a reason because I didn't have to run very far so running was not my thing but I was, but something kind of nagged within me in that winter I was like I want to I want to try this Tough Mudder thing so I signed up for it kind of didn't really train for it did it did did a, one of their events in May of 2011 And when I crossed the finish line, they said, oh, well, you, I was the first woman to cross on their first heat on Sunday, which it's funny. It's not really a race, but I didn't understand the whole concept of how the whole thing works. But anyways, they said, you've qualified for world's toughest mutter, which is a 24 hour obstacle course race, which at the time had never been done before. And they said, oh, and by the way, if you sign up within the next five days, you get a hundred dollar discount. So it was like $300 or something like that. Um, and I don't know, I just, I was just like, huh, okay, well, yeah, yeah. I'll sign up for a 24 hour race. Why not? I just did the longest race of my life at 10 miles. <laughs> and now, now sure. Yeah. 24 hours. Okay. It's May now. And the race was in December. So I've got a lot of months that I can try to figure out what to do, what to train, what to bring, everything like that. Luckily I know some, I uh, had some friends and a training partner who are a pretty extreme endurance athletes in their own right. So I had some, you know, people I could ask about. But the biggest thing I knew, because I was also coaching at the time, was we need accountability. Is you know, it's like if you want to do something, uh, you kind of need something to hold you accountable. Like, and so for me, I started dirt in your skirt. It was my going to be my personal kind of journey to world's toughest mutter. Every day I would be like day one, day two, day three. And I would post on the Facebook page that I created, today I'm going to run two miles. And then I would go run those two miles with my like GPS on my, like map my run or one of those 
I think it was Nike Plus or one of those uh, apps on your phone. And then at night, when I got done with the run, I would go onto the little blog. Back then, it was a, it was just a free blogger site. It wasn't even um, a full website. And I would just say, like, today I went for a two mile run. This is where I went. And this is what it happened. And I always joke around now saying like, and I saw a squirrel, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I just started to, and then I started to muse about what was going on in my brain as I was going for these runs or whatnot. And it was crazy. People started to read it. And I, I still, to this day, I guess it's a lot of it was there weren't that many people. There was almost nobody writing about the sport in general, because it wasn't even really a sport, the activity, I guess you would say. So I would just kind of write about stuff or if I then eventually like I got a new pair of shoes. So intertwined into the article about my run for the day would be the new shoes I tried out and what I thought about the shoes. And then after I went to an event, I would say like, oh, I went to this event over the weekend and this is what I thought of it. And so I was kind of doing like the race recaps and the gear reviews kind of in an organic way because it was just me writing. And I just said, I'm going to write every day. I'm going to train and I'm going to write about what I do to train. And if I eat something cool, maybe I'll write about that. And it just, it, it kept evolving from, from there, um, to the point where it, um, yeah, like that was it. And then, and then I should say that at 2011, cause I was training and I was taking it really seriously. I had my first podiums, uh, that summer. And then from there kind of because I had the website and I was starting to have success as an athlete, um, I had a few different companies kind of say like, hey, we would like to come on board with you. We'd like to sponsor you. And at first it was uh, it was a friend's beverage. Like they made this um, tea that was like an energy tea type thing, super small. They said, we'll, we'll sell it to you for what it costs us to make it if you put our logo on your site. And I was like, great. This sounds awesome. <laughs> and then from there, um, it, it was another, it's actually my friend's uh, uncle happened to do PR for an apparel company and said, hey, you're doing really well. And I do PR for this company and we want to get into this industry and you have this platform. So can we sponsor you as an athlete? And so then I was with, uh, with that company for a few years. So everything kind of evolved and it kept evolving and yeah, kept evolving kind of organically to early 2012. I got an email from a nutrition company that said, Hey, we'd like to sponsor you. And this is a paid like full-time sponsorship. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's the, again, the condensed version. <laughs> no, but that's awesome. And there, there are so many things in there as well. And I think what's really nice is, is when you talked about accountability, because actually that is so, so important because Anybody can sit at home and say, oh, I should do this, I should do that. But actually, when you put it out there publicly, I mean, and you can tell your friends, but this is the power of social media. If you tell, you know, your three or 400 friends or how many friends you've got, yep, I'm going to go for a run today, and then you don't post about it, you know someone's going to be sat at home thinking, oh, I wonder if she's done it. And you almost, you can't let them down. You don't want to let yourself down as well. And I like the fact it was this organic growth and it has been this journey that actually you you then tried out shoes and then you learned from it don't wear cotton <laughs> you know, yeah. don't don't stick with the Gore-Tex you know don't tech, stick with the Gore-Tex shoes and it did just evolve and becoming a sponsored athlete is is absolutely fantastic but let's go back to May you'd run 10 miles and in December you'd signed up for a 24-hour race so there's, there's some quite big jumps that you're making there Take us back to that time and just how did you train? How did you plan? What was going through your head before you even got to like that race? Yeah, definitely. So I have, um, I do, I, I will say that I was not in the best of shape. And, and I, I always preface this, because, but at the same time, I had been an athlete my whole life. So I knew what it took to get to where you want to go. Um, and I think that if you've ever, I think I had a little bit of an advantage because I had already had years of training sort of stored away, um, muscle memory wise, all that sort of stuff, even though I hadn't put it into use in, in, in probably almost five years at that point. Um, but 
Yeah. So, so like I said, the first step was I said, I'm going to create this, this blog to keep me accountable. And then, okay, what else can I a afford and B um, like what resources are out there? Because there are so many and resources if you want to become fit online that you don't have to pay much, much money, if any money for really. Um, and today, if you want to get into obstacle racing, there's tons of resources. When I started it, I was mod podging a whole bunch of pieces together. Luckily, like I said, I lived at a, I was actually a dorm parent at the boarding school as well. So my room, it was an old hotel, um, like 50s ski chalet hotel. <laughs> it converted into a school. So my room, I lived in like a, a room. Uh, my entire existence was in a room. But um, my room that I lived in was at the end of a hallway. And then if I went to the next door over was our gym. So <laughs> I lived about 15 steps from the gym, uh, which is tremendously helpful. I lived a mile from uh, the ski slopes. Uh, well, I lived on the access road for Killington Mountain Resort in the U.S. And but I lived one mile from where the trails all kind of ended, uh, which is also very. So those two things, I had the, the places to work out um, and I sort of made a list of what are the resources I have here? Well, I have the mountain right here. I have the gym right here. OK, what can I do with those two things? And, um, and then I next I looked at I ended up finding it was called like Ultra Ladies or something like that. I found this ultra running because I was like, OK, well, I'm maybe I want to try to get. 50 miles, 50 miles in 24 hours. That's a good, good goal. You know, it's, uh, it's not super fast, but, uh, I think I can train up to that. And I found this, uh, 50 mile training program and it's free. And I just emailed the woman cause she also did co coaching. And I said, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm doing this 24 hour race. I'm doing those stuff. And she said, she's like, well, I have no experience in what you want to do. Um, pretty much nobody did at that point. <laughs> um, and she said, but here's what I might do. If it says run 20 miles on this day, um, you can break it up. You don't have to run all 20 miles or 30 miles all at once. If you want to, you could run 10 miles in the morning and 10 miles at night. Um, you could run. And she's like, maybe that'll help simulate what you're doing because you're doing a lap course. And that was about it. That was about all the direction I got from her. But I had this this program, at least I could sort of base off of and, and use. And it seemed like a pretty much a beginner to 50 miler program over like a four and a half month, five month period. I think it was that the program ran. So I had that. And then I also knew there was a rock climbing gym about 20, 30 minutes from where I lived. And I had because I was a dorm parent, I'd brought the kids down there. I kind of knew the owner a little bit. And I went down and talked to him one day and I just said, Hey, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to train for. I don't have a ton of money, but I, you know, I would like to see if maybe like an hour a week, you and I can just do something one-on-one. -on -one. And it was interesting because, um, Steve, the owner said, this is fantastic. I have had this idea for years to do with somebody to use rock climbing as a tool for general fitness. And he's like, I've been, it's been in my head for years. I've had this name, but I can't really use the name. Um, and once I, his, the name he had thought of was climb fit, which sounds a lot like CrossFit, but he's like, I've literally had this idea for like 20 years. And now that CrossFit's around, I can't really, I don't know what to call it, but that's what it is. And um, so he said, He's like, well, what works for you? What works for me? And we kind of agreed upon like $30 a session um, for me to go once a week. And then and he, the whole plan was I just showed up. He created some crazy workout that sometimes it was flipping poles. Other times it was grabbing cinder blocks and carrying cinder blocks different ways to do grip strength. Sometimes it was bouldering around the gym. Sometimes it was climbing with only hands and no feet, or sometimes it was climbing using no footholds and um, 
all sorts of different. He he had been in the military for 20 plus years. So he had all these different ideas from kind of military and some other training and stuff. And I was his guinea pig. So that was that's um, kind of those all meshed together. And then otherwise, I just kept using online resources that I could find. CrossFit, you know, they put up free workouts. Like you can pretty much see every workout. You don't, you know, if you have a gym, you can kind of do. So I kind of did hybrid of that and just took my coaching background because at that point I had been coaching for about six years, alpine skiing and had taken courses in strength and conditioning and whatnot through. So I kind of just meshed everything together and I was like, what do I need to do to be able to make this happen? And then got to work and trained like a maniac for (laughs) the next couple of months. So you know what, when you were talking about climb fit, the things that were going through my head was, that just sounds so fun. And it's just like the variety and the mixture of different things and whether it's carrying the cinder blocks, doing the bouldering, not having the foots, using the foots, all these different things. It just sounded really, really awesome. And the other thing as well is, well, the two biggest excuses that everybody has, and I and I use these as well, and I think everyone does, is I don't have the time and I don't have the money. And the amount of times that people say, you know, I can't afford it. And do you know what? I really, I get it. I totally understand. But I think, again, with the power of the internet, there are all of the running programs are available online. All the strength and conditioning programs are available online. You can do body weight exercises. You don't need to have a gym. You don't need to have all of this specialist equipment to go out and do it. So you're training like a maniac. You you know, you're recording it all on dirt in your skirt. You're being held accountable. You've gone from this 10-mile race in May Take us to this first Spartan race, this 24-hour race in December. So this was the first ever of this length and distance, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was was actually Tough Mudder. So it was the world's toughest mudder, and it was in English Town, New Jersey, which is in the northeast of the U.S. in December, a couple weeks before Christmas. And it was freezing. That's what I have to say first. <laughs> that it was it was about 40 degrees Fahrenheit when the race started at 10 a.m. in the morning and didn't get much above that during the day. I, there was a rant that I went on for absolutely no reason at this point now. Like I look back and I don't know if you if you have this happen or any anybody listening has ever written you look back at what you wrote years ago and you go why did I write that (laughs) that was so silly anyways yeah so a couple about a month and a half before the race or so it started popping up like hey maybe we should wear wetsuits when we're running or maybe we should wear wetsuits somewhere around this because there's going to be water and then at one point they they said that a wetsuit was mandatory gear and then they quickly and then I like I was one of the people that went crazy. I'm like, how can you say this? And it was only a few weeks before the event. I'm like, how could you mandate something like that? Wetsuits are expensive and just went off. Um, anyways, having a wetsuit is an absolute must for this sort of event. And I did have a wetsuit. Um, it was funny. They they set up this wetsuit temp- tent before the quote unquote swim section of the event <laughs> where you could like change into your wetsuit and then change out of it. Well, the thing is that half the obstacles you got wet in. So by the time you got to the wetsuit area, you, <laughs> you were so wet. Um, I've now been to the event five times. I now have three different wetsuits um, of different different thickness, different lengths, different everything. And tons of different ways to layer. But yeah, so so that year, I think we had, there were about 800 people that signed up for this unknown event. There was all these pretty, pretty impressive athletes from all these different backgrounds. And um, I'd never done anything like this. I had supported a friend, um, my training partner, a couple months earlier who did a double Ironman. So it's an Ironman, but double the distances. So, and you do it in the same order, swim, bike, run, but it's this, you know, took him over 24 plus hours straight. And then also, also helped a a friend who was doing a triple Ironman at the same time. They shared a a 10 by 10 pop-up tent. So I went with them to see what, like what this endurance, like to really see the whole endurance racing thing. And at that point I should say, I did run my first ultra 
as uh, a training to prep for that race. I would worked myself up to, I ran a 50 K in September of 2011. So it was my first ultra marathon. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, like I did some work there, but we got to this race and about 800 people started and about 400 people dropped out of the race within the first lap for hypothermia. My friends and I that I was ended up running with, we all made it through the first lap. We all made it through the second lap. We all made it through the third lap. We took big, long breaks in between, which now I would never take long breaks like that. It just makes it harder to keep going out. So the middle of the night on our fourth lap, it was about 3 a.m. in the morning, I think, when we went out on our fourth lap. And uh, in each lap's uh, about 10 miles long. So we got out on our fourth lap and... It was about 16 degrees Fahrenheit with the wind chill. So all the water obstacles, except for the pond thing we swam through, had iced over. So we were breaking ice through all these obstacles. There's almost no volunteers out at that point because they're all sitting in warm cars because it's so cold outside. Um, (laughs) I was with these two guys, and at that point, I... I had never done, like I said, I'd never done anything like this before. And my brain and body did not know what to do at this point. I was hallucinating. I was seeing things that weren't there. Like there was this part where you're on asphalt and they put tires down to go through the tires. And I thought that each tire inside the tire was like moving water, but it was an unknown depth. So you couldn't actually step into in between the tires. You had to step on top of the tires so that you didn't fall into the hole into the watery abyss like (laughs) i can't make this stuff up because it was just ridiculous there's other things that i saw and i heard um on course that were a hundred percent not there and talking to people after the fact we've now laughed about just just how you know at one point i was weeping and almost running and the guys i was running with um they like could barely keep up with me. It was bizarre. Like there were some bizarre things that happened, but um, I ended up, we ended up taking a break because I was ready to take a nap in the middle of the woods or the middle of this field at you know, about six in the morning or so. Um, we hopped into a medical tent that was on the course. And at that point, um, I just started uncontrollably shaking and I was pretty hypothermic and that was about the end of, of my race there. So I actually, I actually didn't finish that race. Uh, I made it till 7 a.m. in the morning and 10 a.m. was when the race ended. So I made it almost the whole time, which I'm still super proud of because not many people even made it that long. But, uh, it was, um, it was still probably the, the most traumatic thing I've ever (laughs) done. And then at the same time, one of the most fun things in this crazy way, um, it, but yeah, it was pretty traumatic. <laughs> traumatic and also sort of life changing for you. I mean, since then, you went on and you became the first professional obstacle racer. You're ranked fifth in the world. You've done some of the toughest races, the death race. You've done the world's toughest mother four times. You've done survival runs throughout the world. So it was almost this life changing moment for you really like that 2012 race when it all really started to to take off for you because you've been there since the beginning what's it been like for women because you're you're one of the top women out there how have you seen the sport evolve for women out there are there more women doing it was did women did you face a lot of sexism or or was it just everyone's in it together what was it like being out there I would say that the community is pretty good. I, uh, based on other communities that I've been in, it's uh, being when when I was a full time athlete and whatnot. Being on the athlete side, I didn't see a whole lot of um, you know sexism and that sort of thing. I mean, there's obviously some still in, in almost anything. And women are definitely we're definitely more in the minority. It's funny because. When you look at the general participation across the industry, it's pretty close to 50-50 men and women. But when you look at the competitive side, uh, the numbers of women that want to race really competitively versus the number of men, all of a sudden, it I mean, at some races, it's as bad as like 80-20. <laughs> if you're going to take it and do a ratio, 
it, you know, the women would just be, it's just so, so few want to race super competitively or at that. Um, but I think that's the thing about the industry as a whole is you can do both. You can do whatever you want. It's taken me years to sort of come back around to seeing the joy and just doing it for the fun of doing it, just doing something for the sake of having fun and having, having it be like that. But, um, I would say since I, since I ended up more on the, now that I work full time on the media side and don't really race competitively anymore, well, don't race competitively more at all. But, uh, I would say I've seen more, I've had more hurdles to jump through being a female on the media side of it all than I did as an athlete. Interesting. That's no. Nice. Like, Sorry, get carry on. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say I I find that I have to work I think twice as hard to get half the respect sometimes. <laughs> it, it's it's getting better, but a lot of times that's the way it feels like. No, absolutely, absolutely. I I get that. So about all the races you've done, which has been your highlight? Which has been the race which has stood out for you? There's three. Sorry, I have three that are kind of like the biggest highlights uh, across the the spectrum. So in 2012, I did the death race and I did the death race for about 24 plus hours. It's funny because all these races I'm about to talk about, I'm like, well, I didn't finish that one. But um <laughs> So the death race, it's this race where they don't tell you when it starts. They don't tell you when it finishes. They send you this crazy list of things that you need to carry with you. The year I did it, other than the normal kit of like bring food, bring water, change the socks, whatever, all that sort of stuff, first aid kit, you had to have a bag of human hair. Bizarre. Yeah, totally bizarre. I went to my hairdresser and said, can you just put a bag of somebody's hair in a Ziploc bag for me. And she said, yeah. And what it was used for was they used for absolutely nothing. At one point they said, everybody grab your bags of hair and put it in this bin. And that was it. You just had to have, it was just a weird thing you had to have. Um, but anyways, yeah. So I, I got into that race and I should say that I lived five miles from the founders of that race. And I trained with one of the founders. Sometimes we'd go for runs and stuff once or twice a week together. And I knew his kids and I knew his wife and everywhere I went in town for the like month before the race, everybody knew I was doing this, the the death race. So they're all like, oh, you're going to do so well. Oh, you're going to win. Oh, you're going to do this. Oh, you're going to do that. Oh, you're going to do this. Oh, you're going to do that. So it was interesting. By the time I actually got to the race, I could care less about kind of doing it. It was this weird, like the training leading up to it was awesome, but the actual getting there, I just didn't have that motivation to be there as much. I was going through the motions and I went about 24 hours in the event. And then I was, I got to a point where I was just like, I don't, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't, I don't want to be doing this. And I said to the race, um, the guys who run the race more than once, I said, how badly do you want me to race? Which is a terrible thing to say. If you're ever asking a race director how badly they want you to be in a race, you probably shouldn't be racing. And then, and then again, like the, uh, I'm one of the race directors. I was like, okay, I'm done. I quit. I'm done. I handed out all my food to people. I was getting ready to take a ride back. And then the other founder came in and he was like, well, have you done all the tasks so far? I'm like, yes. He's like, have you, um, we haven't radioed in any of the, the drops yet. So you're still in the race, just stay in the race, stay with me. And we had this 10 minute conversation where I'm like, I don't want to do this. And I had like expletives <laughs> in there and he was like, no, just do this. Just stay in it. Like, I just want you to stay in it. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. So he'd circle, talk to me back into it. And I start trying to do it, trying to race a little bit more. And I'm just listening to all these people, um, you know, just they're like, I don't know, for lack of a better term, like sucking up to the one of the race directors as we're running back from one task to this other up and over these mountains back to this other town. And I'm listening and I'm like, I don't I don't want to do this. I don't. And so I turned around and ran away <laughs> from the race director <laughs> and um, pulled myself from the race. But what isn't what's remarkable is not the fact I quit a race, but it's like whatever. But it's the fact that that was the first time in my adult life 
well, really in my entire life, but as an adult that I decided I don't want to be doing something and quit and stopped and stopped doing something that other people wanted me to do, but I didn't want to do it. So I just said, I'm done. I'm done. Like, and ran away, <laughs> literally ran away. But the, and then I took a nap for a couple hours and I came back and I helped out the race for the next day. So there was no animosity or anything. It was just, I, I was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be doing this. So that was the first one. But I was just going to admit, on that one, I think it's a really interesting topic you brought up, like stopping, quitting, finishing, not doing it. And there's, there's so many different things which are mixed up in that. And I think it's really difficult to know sometimes who you're doing it for or why you're doing it. And if you don't understand why you're doing it or what the motivation is behind it, then it can be really difficult, I think, to get you to get you through. But how how do you think oh, what am I trying to get at? Like quitting, stopping, not finishing. How did that impact you in other areas? Because I I I personally I I always feel like I've let myself down. I haven't given my all. I, you know, I feel I've, I've failed, and it's that it's that failure like hanging over, and um, it's almost like really difficult to get out of. Does that make sense? Where I'm going? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say that I felt that way after World's Toughest Mudder, feeling like I just I wasn't good enough. I would say that, that but. For the death race, I had a very different reaction. Um, I actually was really proud of the fact that I quit and I stopped or whatever words you want to use, ran away, because it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that I don't have to do anything. Like It was the first time in my life that I had that realization that I don't have to do something. I am doing something because I choose to, I mean, I have to breathe. There are certain things that we do have to do to function as just being alive. But for the most part, all these things that we find ourselves sometimes saying, I have to do this. I have to go to this thing. You probably don't have to, you're choosing to do it. And um, for me, it was the first step in deciding that about a month and a half later is when I quit my day job that I had kind of found myself on a track that I didn't even know how I got there. Like, um, I had a great job. I just, it wasn't all of a sudden it was like, how did I, how, how am I here? Like, I'm not even really enjoying my job and I'm not enjoying my life. So quitting the death race was the first step towards me quitting my job a month and a half later. If that makes any sense. It's kind of crazy. It's a crazy story to kind of, and I, it's only been years later that I've been able to put all the pieces together. Like quitting that gave me the courage to then, you know, stop doing other things in life that I was doing just because I was on some track that I got on one day. Um, I know it's like when you and I talked about this when you're on my podcast, but it's like when you're in the banking world, it's like when you decided to leave the banking world, I'm sure people are like, well, but you're on such a great track. Like life is so good this direction. You're like, yeah, but it's not the one I want to be on. And it's, and sometimes you don't even know how or why you ended up on this certain pathway. And you, it's, it's like you've just been asleep and you wake up and you're like, oh, what am I doing here? I thought this is what I wanted. Then it's like, no, it's not. But it is amazing how it's it can be these things which you can only look back on from like years ago and finally sort of connect the dots and be like, oh, that happened then and then that happened that because of that. And it sort of evolves and that's, yeah, that's how you create this whole new life, which is what you've done for yourself with, with Dirt in the Skirt and the podcast and the website and everything that you've been, um, everything that you've been doing. You, you mentioned another race. What was, what was another race that stood out for you? Yeah. So the other one was a um, survival run. I would say that one was a huge race um, for me. Again, it's a mental and a lot of these races. And I think you speak to anybody who's done long endurance events, whether they finish something in place well, or maybe sometimes they didn't finish. I think sometimes the races that we don't finish, we learn the most from, or at least I learn, <laughs> I've learned the most from. But um, I, I was in Nicaragua doing this race called survival run, um, which is, we'll have to like link some videos to it. Cause it's really hard to describe the race, but basically it's this, it's this ultra endurance race about 
70, sorry, 70 kilometers long and it takes place over about 24 hours and all the, ta- and you have to do tasks along the way. And the tasks all relate to the island culture of this island of Omatepe in the middle of Lake Nicaragua. And so I got into the race and again, I don't know, I'm probably, I don't know, probably almost 40, 50 K into the race. And I got to this, this moment where we had to carry these long bamboo poles. I mean, they were probably 20, 25 feet long up the side of this, uh, dormant volcano along this trail. And it was not, (laughs) it's not made to carry. It's almost single track trail all the way. So I'm carrying it up and then you get to this checkpoint where we had to then put the, um, bamboo pole against a tree and then climb up the bamboo pole into the tree to um, take these wristbands out. And the wristbands were kind of signified that you have completed each task. So I got there and I'm trying to climb up this pole and I could not do it. I just, I was there for probably 45 minutes or more repeatedly over and over again, just failing, failing, getting so close, but failing so close. But it's like, and along the way, um, I think my, my calf or something brushed up against, uh, 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 some vine or something. And, uh, I ended up getting this crazy, um, thorn in my, in my calf that turned it, you know, basically just knotted up my entire calf for the next two weeks after it. There was some sort of toxin in the in that thorn. But that's the, that's not. But what really happened was I, I repeatedly was just failing and failing and failing. And I'm and I've had a lot of success. Most of the things I do in life, I don't I don't fail at very often. Like I, I work really hard to not fail almost to the detriment. <laughs> like I work, you know, like I just keep going and, and, and put a lot of research and stuff in it. So this is something I just hit and I just could not do it. And I freaked out. I didn't freak out at anybody, but I, um, threw, picked up this, this like piece of wood and like threw it at the woods and then like collapsed down and just totally flipped out. And, um, Ironically, they were filming all of this for a that they're trying to make the race into possibly a special or a, a series or or whatnot. So all of this has been caught on video, <laughs> which I've now actually seen the video more than once. And then the next day after. So that's where my race ended. I had to climb back down off this mountain and, you know, had to uh, kind of my tail between my legs and realize that. Guess what? I, I can't always do everything. But um yeah. So the next day they interviewed me about it and I had to describe in detail that moment and what I was feeling. And I just bawled <laughs> for like the hour and a half interview we did. I just cried the whole time. And uh, I remember it's, I, I learned something along the way that if you're ever being interviewed and you can't control your emotions, just stop talking <laughs> until you compose yourself again because they can't use basically anything when you're just crying and there's no words. Um, so I would just sit there and cry. And the guy that was head of the production, who's actually a friend of mine too, he was just like, Mark, you have to keep talking. And I was just like, no. <laughs> but I've now, I've watched some of the interview that I did and I've watched the video of me freaking out. And it was a really good moment of just kind of realizing that, like, I understand those are true raw emotions, but I don't want to be like that. That's not the type of person I want to be. So it kind of let me grow. And, you know, when you have to, you like look at yourself all of a sudden, you're like, oh man, that was me. That is me. I don't want to be like that though. So it was a big like growth moment. So, so that was number two. And then the third was the first Spartan race beast was on Killington, Vermont, which was their first race they did. That was about a half marathon distance. And I finished third in that race. And that was my first um, obstacle racing podium. So, so I ended on a happy one. <laughs> That's awesome. But it's interesting, like, on you know, on point two, um, you know, on race number two, talking about yeah. when you do challenge yourself, whether it's doing obstacle course racing, running ultra distances, getting outside your comfort zone, like, it does change you as a person. And sometimes you do have these breakthroughs and they could be physical breakthroughs, emotional breakthroughs, mental breakthroughs, like all these different things because you've 
you've learned a huge amount about yourself from having that experience and going through that that frustration and dealing with with that failure. So just quickly, tell us a little bit about your mission for Dirt in Your Skirt and a little bit about your podcast. Sure. So um, Dirt in Your Skirt, obviously it started as a personal thing, but then quickly it's kind of grown beyond me. These days it's mostly the podcast. Every once in a while I'll throw a random musing in, um, kind of mostly about what kind of we're doing nutritionally in our house. Um, the website started is just obstacle racing now because I work with mud run guide doing obstacle racing stuff there every day during your skirts, kind of adjusting to being more, um, women focused health wellness, just sharing women's stories. And the podcast is really just an extension of that much like your podcast. But, um, um, you know, we have, have every week I've got different women come on telling their stories, A lot of them are kind of off on the fringe of what you consider normal, everyday um, life. And then also have some experts come on. Um, In the new year, we've got um, an author already, one author booked and hopefully a couple more based kind of in the health and wellness space and just kind of sharing their knowledge um, that, that, yeah, that that I find interesting and that hopefully the listeners find interesting. But um, I'm about 20, 20, when this comes out, uh, 20 something episodes in. Which is awesome. And I'm episode number 18, so make sure you check it out. But um, I was going <laughs> to ask you, I was going to ask you about your podcast. When, did, when do your episodes come out? My episodes come out on Tuesdays. I'm not as good as you. They come out on Tuesday at some point in the day. I don't have it down to an exact hour right now. I know your yours is like seven o'clock. on point exactly. And although I, sem- li- I sometimes cheat because like because sometimes I'm not sure. I'm just, I think the system's slow, so I actually put it out at six o'clock. So it will definitely be there for seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to work on it. It's normally out. Um, I would say it's out by. I try to have it out by noon at the latest on Tuesday and I'm in mountain time in the United States. So that's like night, Tuesday night uh, for UK listeners. Do you know what's really amazing is we actually both sponsor each other's podcasts on uh, through Patreon, Patreon, Patron, Patron. I know. I love that. And and you're and we, I'm, I'm constantly retweeting stuff you've tweeted and you're retweeting stuff that I've tweeted. So I hope that people listening to this that haven't listened to mine, check mine out. And I hope that people that have listened to when you're on my show, check your yours out because you've got some amazing women on and, and I, I'm honored that I'm honored that I got to be on it. Yay. <laughs> and what, I was going to say me too. As I love this. It's, it's all about collaboration, not competition, which is a message we're pushing. Um, but where's the best place for people to get in contact with you? Are you big on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook? Where, where are you on social media? Uh, all of the above. I am on, so the website, you can always, if you want to email me directly, you can just email me directly through the website. That's, um, the easiest if you want to email me, but otherwise, um, and that's dirt in your skirt.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. It's all dirt in your skirt. So, um, pretty much across the board, I guess I have a Pinterest account. I'm not very good at Pinterest. Um, I'll admit that I don't, I, I love finding recipes on there, but I am terrible about posting stuff there, but try to post, um, or at least link to the articles and the podcast and stuff over there as well. Um, and I think, think that's it, but I don't know, Instagram, if you like, uh, the other thing we didn't talk about that you can get a glimpse into my life on Instagram is we have an urban farm in our backyard. So I have 13 chickens, three beehives, a bunch of gardens. Um, and I love food. So a bunch of random food stuff and my dog shows up on Instagram. So (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely awesome. And what I'll be doing is I'll be making sure I put all of the links to Dirt in Your Skirt, to, Mar- to Margaret's website, her social media accounts, her Instagram and Facebook, etc., in the show notes, which will be available at toughgirlchallenges.com. But Margaret, thank you so much. I'm not even going to try and pronounce your surname, but thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing more about your journey, about OCR racing, and more about Dirt in Your Skirt. That's absolutely awesome. Well, thank you so much.
Hey tribe, how you doing? I hope you're well. Now I very rarely do this, but I found this really funny. So I obviously had a bit of a problem trying to pronounce a Margaret's surname, so I'll give you a little one of the out clips. Today we're going to be speaking to the amazing Margaret Schlockler. <laughs> I can't even say your name. Say your name for me again. Uh, Margaret Schlockter. Schlockter. Margaret Schlockter. Schlo- oh, I hate this. Margaret Schlockter. Ah. Oh. Oh, I said it right. Damn it. Okay. Today we're going to speak to you, Margaret Slock. Ah. Oh. So unfortunately, this is how I can spend some of my time editing, is generally trying to edit out my fluffs and my mistakes and my horrendous pronunciation. So if you've been listening for a while, you do know I struggle with certain names and certain things. But um, but yeah, it's, it's all good. Thank you again for listening, everybody. I massively appreciate all of your support. I mentioned it at the beginning, the podcast would not be coming out without the support of all of the patrons of the Tough Girl podcast. So if you are a patron, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart it really does make a massive difference having these funds coming in every single month it's it is really really helping me to grow and develop the podcast so i do honestly appreciate it please do go check out the website toughgirlchallenges.com for more detailed show notes and all the links to margaret's website her dirt in the skirt her twitter account all of that good stuff and you'll also find all of the information to the previous episodes that we've released which go back to as far as august 2015 there's now over well over 100 hours of free content for you to listen to. So if you are having a bad day and you need some inspiration, you need a boost, then go back and listen to one of our previous episodes, whether that's from Challenge Sophie, whether that is um, Sally who rode across the Atlantic Ocean, Joe Bradshaw for climbing Mount Everest, Tori James for climbing Mount Everest, Cheryl Hunter. There are so many back episodes that you can go and list, listen to. So you could always start again from the beginning. Um, thank you again for all of your support. Now, if you may be thinking, what is the Tough Girl Tribe? The Tough Girl Tribe is a community of women that I've created. and uh, It's a closed Facebook group with the sole purpose of connecting the listeners of the Tough Girl podcast. It's a space where women can come together, they can ask questions, they can support one another, especially if you've feel as though maybe you're slightly isolated. I mean, I certainly know I have that. When I say to the world, I want to go and run across the Sahara Desert, most people do look at you a little bit strangely and think, what What is she talking about? Why would she want to go and do that? So if you've got some, if you're harboring some big dreams, some big ambitions, and you just need to get some support, come and check out the closed Facebook group. And if you've got knowledge and expertise that you can share, please do comment on the post. Please do share articles which you think are relevant and that other women would enjoy reading because it is there for you guys to to use as well the seven women seven challenges um, is still going on if you haven't heard about that what I've done is through the feedback from the Tough Girl Tribe, I selected with the help of the Tough Girl Tribe seven women who in 2017 were undertaking a new challenge for them. So we've got a whole variety of women and we are following them along every single step of their journey. And every six to eight weeks or so, we catch up with these women and see what they're learning, what problems they're facing, how they're overcoming their problems. So please do go check it out. The first episode came out on the 1st of January and the second episode came out on the the 12th of February. They are long episodes because there are seven interviews included within each one, but you'll gain a lot from listening to these women, to these ordinary women, to these real women who are undertaking extraordinary challenges from trying to go after their first ultra. So never running before. So this is Ray Red, never running before and going after an ultra. Laura Try, who is going to be rowing around the coast of Great Britain. Jen Dixie Horn, who has got this amazing cycling challenge, wanting to cycle the jog and do an adventure race in Scotland after that. There's Jojo as well, who's part of the Um, who's training to be part of the American 50k team so please do go and listen to those episodes as well there's there's so many more things I could talk about but um, I I think I've talked quite a lot on this episode thank you again for all your support have an amazing week and I'll be with you next Tuesday for another episode of the tough girl podcast make sure you hit that subscribe button take care I'll speak to you soon lots of love (laughs) 